Hey, what is up everyone? I hope everyone's having a great day. Today I want to go over the most influential albums in my life that made me the musician I am today. When I was a kid growing up in the 80s, I would listen to things that my sister would show me or what my friends would show me, and then I'd go to the record store and comb through all the different albums. I would sometimes just listen to things based on the cool album covers. And along the way, I would find really cool albums, stuff that really sort of made me want to do music all along the way. They kept were like leap stones, leapfrog stones or whatever you want to call them that helped me just sort of be a musician the entire way. So this isn't a list of my favorite albums. This is a list of the most influential albums and the top 10 of them. So here it goes. Starting this list off at number 10 is Strange Ways Here We Come by The Smiths. This is the first album that I really got into. My sister exposed me to modern rock in the early 80s because she listened to like The Cure, Depeche Mode, New Order, and all those other bands. And so when I heard what she was listening to, this is the one that I said, hey, this, is, this music stuff's really cool. And I listened to this album over and over and over again. I would listen to all these songs on repeat and still I would go on YouTube and listen to these songs once in a while. And it's the most influential, one of the most influential because this one was the first time I got into an album and kind of just opened Pandora's box from here. Number nine is Bad Motor Finger by Soundgarden. I was very saddened when Chris Cornell passed. He was a big influence on the way I sing today. He was always a singer that I thought, wow, I'll just never be able to achieve that. Some of the stuff that he could pull off, I would just listen to it as, as if I was listening to some other worldly person, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. I love the music. It was one of the first really heavy albums I got into, and I just can't say enough about it. I mean, I've listened to Outshine so many times, you'd think I would be, get, I'd be like sick of it, but I'm not. I'll never get sick of that album. It's so good. At number eight is I Remember Clifford by Arturo Sandoval. Now you might be thinking, what? This comes out of left field. Who's Arturo Sandoval? What is this about? I play jazz more just as much as I played rock. I played jazz starting at in elementary school all the way through college. And if I had the time, I'd still play it today. Arturo Sandoval was a player much like when I mentioned Chris Cornell doing things that I didn't think I could ever do, he would do those things on trumpet. He can hit crazy high notes in the most insane ways, notes that you wouldn't even think are possible. I've seen him many times at Yoshi's in the Bay Area. I remember speaking with him and he, he had great inspirational words for me. I was a little bit too starstruck to sort of remember what he said. My favorite tracks on this album are I Remember Clifford and Cherokee. I Remember Clifford is an homage to the, the late Clifford Brown, person who did pass back in the 50s. He was a great improvisational trumpet player, an amazing one. So amazing that the other track he did on this album, Cherokee, he actually takes his solo and uses it as the verse. And anyone who plays jazz knows that Cherokee's tough. Not only the changes are a little bit tricky, changes aren't even that tricky, it's just the tempo is so blazing fast. And Clifford, Clifford Brown's solo on that is just a masterpiece. So he actually uses it as a part of the song, plays it. They also do that on the GRP All-Star Big Band where they harmonize it, which is insane. But I like this album better. Number seven is Undertow by Tool. When I first heard Tool, I had a mixed reaction. It was part, I don't know if I should be listening to this, and this is really cool. The album cover was creepy. It had this weird uh, secret track at the end where the guy, this pastor, is talking about the carrots. And then at the very, very end, they just had this guy talking about life feeds on life, life feeds on life. This album gets under your skin. It makes you feel icky and gross. And it is really a part of Tools, I think it's telling a tale, starting at Opiate all the way to the latest album. They're telling a tale of, a, of the ascension of a man, but in the tale of Undertow, this is where this guy is like broken down to his lowest point, to where he starts to rebuild and like drop a bunch of acid and enema. But this album was so influential on me. I would listen to it so many times. My favorite uh, songs on this is Swamp Song, Undertow, I think those two would be, probably I could say those are my favorite. They just make me feel creeped out. I remember 
in the early stages of the internet, I would go seek out pictures of Maynard and the band, and I would hear, there would always be these rumors about Tool, like, oh, someone put out this rumor about like, oh, I saw Maynard in the, the sewer grates, and he was lurking around in the sewer. So it's like, it's just stupid stuff like that. But I was maybe 14 or 15. I bought it as true, because if you look at the album covers, they got their mouth gaping open, and they're all crazy and stuff like that. I was a very gullible teenager, but I'm glad I was because this album was like a audible horror movie that provided a lot of hours of entertainment. What influenced me the most was the lyrical content. I would say that my early lyrical, even today, how I phrase things were inspired by this album. Now, I don't get all mystical like Maynard does but it's just the sort of way he throws out abstract things, sort of to, I don't know if he, he intentionally does it to leave it open for wide interpretation, but that's how I, um, that's how I took it. So that's how I used it. So I would say that's the way, the, lyric, the lyrical construction, the way that words were used was the most influential on me. Here we are at number six is Core by Stone Temple Pilots. I can't say enough about this one. When I was first shown this album, my sister got it. She said, I don't like this. You might like it. You like that, you like that tool stuff and all that. You're liking metal or whatever. So I listened to it. And I gotta admit, the first time I heard I'm Dead and Bloated, that's the lead off track. I wasn't sure if I liked it. I was just like, what is this guy? What's going on? And then the rest of the songs played, and as I as the more of them played, and the hooks just came one after the other, then Dead and Bloated soon became, I understood it and then soon became one of my favorite songs. It still is like one of my favorite songs when Octane play it. I'm just like, yeah, Octane doesn't play it. I think it's Lithium or some other channels play it. But whenever it comes on, I'm just like, yeah, this is a great album. It's one of the albums that if I could wear out, if you could wear out CDs, this would have been worn out. Stone Temple Pilots maybe would be no surprise to any of you that was most influential on me for vocal styling, for phrasing. Scott Weiland's vocal range is very similar to mine, and so I sort of modeled, didn't model it, but I was I found it just easier to sing along to him than anyone else. So maybe it rubbed off on me a little bit too much, and I wish I didn't allow it to, because throughout my career, I was compared to, oh, these just sound like Stone Temple Pilots, or Velvet Revolver. And at the time I thought, oh, what a great compliment, you know, mission accomplished. But that's just not what you want to do. It doesn't help you in the long run, especially having a career. And it really, really hurt me. So, but nonetheless, I mean, I love this album for everything it gave me, for all the great listening hours. I was very mixed about Scott Weiland's passing because I got no business to say that I think he was a numbskull for what he did. So I'm just going to say I was sad about it. At number five, we have Dirt by Alice in Chains. So much like Core, this is one that I was just super immersed into. The first time I heard the, uh, Dem Bones, the lead off track. Okay, so when I listened to Core the first time, I was iffy. When I first heard Dem Bones off of Alice in Chains' Dirt, I was like, oh, I'm, I am all in. Like just the first four seconds like it, I was hooked I didn't care what came after that I was like that's a great feeling that album was amazing much like Stone Temple Pilots I was very influenced by Lane Staley's vocals and it really shaped the way I sing and I'm gonna go back to say like it also was a sort of a detriment I also got compared to Lane Staley I also lend it heavily from his harmony stylings. He would be known for using fifths over some really dark material. Not as dark as like Tool, but definitely darker than Stone Temple Pilots. They also gave me a kind of a creepy, eerie feeling that I really liked. It wasn't as much, it wasn't as creepy as Tool, but it was just sort of like a middle one. You felt really grimy. I thought it was like the heaviest thing I've ever heard, you know. At that time, it wasn't the heaviest thing, but it was the heaviest commercial thing. So, yeah, it's another one of those albums where if I could wear it on the CD, it would have been totally worn out. I've listened to this thing back to back and back over and over again countless times. 
I will always be grateful for what it gave me. We're here at number four. Number four is 10 by Pearl Jam. This one was a doozy. I remember when my friend Marshall came over in my house, he said, you gotta listen to this tape. It was on tape. And I think I played it on a Walkman and we just sort of had, we shared earbud, like ear, the AirPods or whatever, not the AirPods, but the headphones. And we were, he was playing me even flow. And I, I was just like, yeah, this is cool, man. This was really cool. And this was just about when they started getting played on the radio, just bef maybe even just before, but it was just around the time. So we listened to this album, we loved it. I just was just taken back by how cool it was. Obviously, Vetter influenced a lot of vocalists, including myself. And you, you know, like the whole term is called yarling, where other vocalists got claimed to be like Eddie Vedder impersonators or whatever, like Creed and even Stone Temple Pilots and all the other guys were grunge guys. They got been like, oh, you're just doing Vedder vocals, you know, you could just, Grrr, you know. But I, if you listen to Eddie, like he doesn't really even sing like that. This album is so great, in my opinion. It's just one of my favorite things. Oh, I, I admit, I actually listened to it so much, I got a little bit tired of hearing it. Like if Jeremy comes on the radio, I, I'm probably gonna, I might just pass just because I've listened to it that many times. It doesn't mean it's a bad song. It doesn't mean any of that, but yeah, I've listened to this just to exhaustion. So what I will say is I took most of from it is probably lyrical. Like I would also write lyrics in the style of Vetter because Vetter also wrote very abstractly, just much like uh, Maynard did and the vocal stylings. Sometimes people would say, hey, yeah, he sound a little bit like Vetter too. But not as much, thankfully. So at number three is Dizzy Gillespie and the United Nations Orchestra live at the Royal Festival Hall. This is another jazz album, and it features Arturo Sandoval, Dizzy Gillespie, Claudio Roditi, and a cast of other amazing jazz legends. I only mentioned the trumpet players because that's all I cared about when I was a kid. These were like sport, sport figures to me. They could just... They could just do all these crazy, amazing, nimble things on the trumpet. This album is Cuban jazz. Dizzy Gillespie uh, named the band the United Nations Orchestra, not out of sort of any sort of official title. He just looked around the room and he saw that everyone was some, from a different country. And he thought that was really cool. It was a big, broad spectrum of people from all around the world. This album's just straight fire, man. Top, top to bottom great jazz album if you haven't heard it if you're into jazz you probably have already heard it and if you're not into jazz you probably never heard it you might not like it but for me my favorite tracks are the lead off one Tintin Deo and then A Night in Tunisia at the end Arturo Sandoval does just some pretty meme -y stuff at the end this was before memes he was just doing like all three trumpet players would do their little solo amazing solos. Arturo Sandoval did this one where he was just like doing all these crazy stuff and then he busts out the, bust out a uh, classical, he busts, I busts out a piccolo trumpet I think and just does a little classical number right in the middle of his solo, just out of nowhere. Just just a swag, swag around the room, shows chops. Then he finally finishes off with just a ridiculously, just ridiculous high notes. The song was amazing, they were, all the arrangements and all the tracks are great. It just made me want to practice trumpet more in high school. I listened to that, I practiced along, just over and over and over again. Such a great album, can't say enough. All right, we're getting to the end. We're at number two. Number two is Temple of the Dog, self-titled album. This album, man, I just, I, I am at a loss for words as to what I can say, how much it influenced me. It has probably my favorite song of all time, Hunger Strike, that is, Eddie Vedder and Chris Cornell singing. It, it gives me chills just talking about it. I I can't explain how much it really molded and shaped me in every single way. The, the the track the tracks are so good. It is such a good album, and it still is to this day. And at, back then it was just known as a supergroup collaboration, and I think that might have overshadowed how great the material was because at the time it was just like an all-star cast you know it was like the best of the best of Seattle because it was all about grunge at that time but 
just looking back at it, it's just so damn spectacular. That's it. I mean, this is the top of the mountain for me. And the reason, the only reason why it's not number one is you'll find out what number one is right now. We're here at number one, the top of the mountain. I wouldn't even be here today without this album. I don't know what I'd be doing. Maybe I'd be doing YouTube videos about selling insurance. Or maybe I'd be a computer programmer. But with us, without this album, I wouldn't be here talking about memes and music and singing and stuff like that. I'm going to take you back. I was around age 11. I was at my friend Justin's house. He's the only friend that I had that had a Sega Genesis. So we'd go over there, we'd play Golden Axe, we'd play uh, Moonwalker. And I think we were playing Golden Axe at the time. And we are having a good time. And then uh, we were talking about music, about being in the band. And Justin's dad came out and said, hey, you guys want to hear a really cool album? You guys want to hear something really cool? And we just kind of rolled our eyes because it's just like, yeah, what's he going to do? Play some old dad stuff that we don't want to hear. And so we kind of just say, yeah, he's like, no, trust me, listen to this, you guys will love it. Especially if you're thinking about playing trumpet. So I said, okay, okay. So he actually had this uh, record out and he put it on the record player. And what played is the number one album. It's Conquistador by Maynard Ferguson. This album, when he played it, the first track, when he played Conquistador for us, I was just listening. And I didn't know what the heck was this was. But all I know is that I was mesmerized. I was tranced. I was locked in. I was just, it zonked me out. I thought, I don't know what I was thinking. Just thinking. And then it just, it was so amazing. I just thought this was the coolest thing I've ever heard. I just went from 180 degrees or 180, just full 180s thinking like he's going to play us some nonsense to, wow, this is just and then at that moment I knew like this is what I want to do this is it this is the coolest thing I've ever seen like this was like showing a kid monster trucks or wrestling or explosions or this was it for me I was just like I'm all in I'm all in I was obsessed he um, obviously didn't give me the album but after I listened to the song we would listen to we listened to it again and we were just like I was just like, man, this is it. I've got myself a copy of it and I listened to it and I did wear out that LP because I did found a I did find a copy at a Goodwill a along with a bunch of Tia, Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. I picked those up too, but I did find it. I wore it out and I bought another and I finally got it on CD and I had my own little boom box and I played that over and over again. All the tracks on this album are great. It sounds a little funky. It almost sounds like porno music sometimes, but it was the 70s. I think a lot of drugs were involved. There's an amazing list of musicians on there. I don't know, I don't remember any of them. I just know that Maynard's on there. Maynard Ferguson is a very controversial figure in jazz. Not controversial because of anything he's done, but controversial with like just the music he plays. And some people think he's like the master of cheesy music. If you listen to some of his covers, like he did a cover of Rocky, he did a cover of Star Trek, <laughs> the Star Trek theme, and it sounds like a mixture of Star Trek and disco. And it might sound like just the worst elevator music you've ever heard, but for me, it was everything. I was just so damn into that album and everything he did. Maynard Ferguson was a person that I sought after as far as I wanted albums. I went after fan club. There was no internet at that time. So I actually got his fan club called Fanatics for Ferguson. We, we'd get in the mail. I had to like send away for it. I'd, I had to put in an envelope, send away some money. I think a check that my, I asked my dad to write. And then I would get a little homemade newsletter every, I think it was every month, every two months. But anyway, I wouldn't be here without this album. It's amazing. If you haven't heard it before, go check out Conquistador by Maynard Ferguson on YouTube. And you can see what made me who I am. It was really fun doing this list. And I hope that you take the time to listen to these tracks and see if you can find some common ground with me. 
All right. Bye-bye.